This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. We did not, however, identify evidence that rose to the level of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Because the evidence fell short of that standard, I declined to recommend criminal charges against Mr. Biden. Special counsel Robert Hur testified for more than four hours before the House Judiciary Committee on Tuesday. Standing steadfastly by the assessments of his year-long investigation in his 345-page report that recommended no criminal charges be brought against President Joe Biden for his handling of classified documents. And Herr insisted repeatedly that his description of the 81-year-old president as a, quote, sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory, a description that set off a political firestorm, was necessary to include. My assessment in the report about the relevance of the president's memory was necessary and accurate and fair. Most importantly, what I wrote is what I believe the evidence shows and what I expect jurors would perceive and believe. But her faced aggressive questions, often in the form of accusations from the members of both parties with Republicans like California Congressman Tom McClintock saying that the evidence for prosecution was there and her gave Biden a pass. All I have to do when I'm caught taking home uh, classified materials to say, I'm sorry, Mr. Herbert, but I'm getting old. My memory's not so great. Congressman, this is the doctrine that you've established in our laws now, and it's frightening. And Democrats like California Congressman Adam Schiff saying the language characterizing Biden as an old man with a poor memory was not only unnecessary, but against Department of Justice policy. That is nowhere in the rules. I was to prepare a confidential report that was comprehensive and thorough of an What is in the rules, Mr. Herr, what is in the rules is you don't gratuitously do things to prejudice the subject of an investigation when you're declining to prosecute. You don't gratuitously add language that you know will be useful in a political campaign. You were not born yesterday. You understood exactly what you were doing. It was a choice. You certainly didn't have to include that language. Joining me is former federal prosecutor Michael Zeldin, who also served as a deputy independent counsel. I want to start with Hur's report itself. The conclusion of his report was that no criminal charges were warranted against Biden. What's your take on how he got to that decision and how he reported on it? It was very curious to me. The first sentence of the report says that Yes, he did nothing that warranted indictment, but he engaged in willful conduct in retention and willful conduct in distribution, which would be, you know, blocking and tackling basics for a charge. But he walks away from charging him because he says he would present himself to a jury, probably, as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. So I found that incredibly confusing. One is, if he willfully possessed and willfully distributed, then that's the basis for a charge. If the evidence was soft and it wasn't as clearly willful, then he should have said, you could argue willfulness, but in this case, totality of the evidence would undermine a finding of willfulness by a jury. But this notion that he would likely present himself to a jury in this way struck me as very difficult to understand because, one, he has no idea how Biden would present himself to a jury. Two, he doesn't even know whether Biden would ever take the witness stand to present himself to a jury. And so it seemed to me that he really should have limited his findings to the evidence presented. And if he felt that he willfully obstructed or willfully retained or willfully distributed, then he should have charged him. If he felt that the evidence was not sufficiently willful, then he should say there are extenuating circumstances to undermine the notion of willfulness, and therefore I didn't charge. So I didn't like anything about the way he constructed his evidence and the reporting of it. And after four hours of testimony, it wasn't any clearer what he meant or what he intended. But uh prodding from both sides. And Democrats were up in arms about his description of Biden, as you mentioned, as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. He 
said he needed to say that. It was necessary, accurate, and fair. He had to explain why Biden's memory would make it hard to prove to a jury that the president broke the law. Did you buy his explanation, or were those just partisan words thrown in there? Well, I don't know if I would call them partisan, but they were certainly naive in failing to realize what implications words like that would have. And I think Adam Schiff sort of had it right when he said to her during his five minutes, you could have said, as to this document, I found the evidence to be less than convincing. As to that document, it was a little bit more convincing, but there were extenuating circumstances because we sort of quarreled about what the meaning of classified meant. Did it mean private? Did it mean classified in a, in a national security sense? Was it a diary entry like Reagan or a national security marked document like Trump possessed? He could have explained all that stuff in very granular detail without the need to say in this overarching sort of prediction of how Biden would likely present himself. So I think Schiff had it right in that exchange that her was, I don't want to attribute to her partisanship, but I will say that he did have a tin ear for the implications of this. And I think that the White House Counsel's Office recognized that in their efforts to have them rethink this language. But of course, they didn't prevail and Merrick Garland didn't dare change any of hers language for fear of cover up. And so it is as it is. And something else Adam Schiff said, that you don't do things to prejudice the subject of an investigation when you're declining to prosecute. He said that's that's the rule. That is the rule. And, and you see this occur in various contexts. So, for example, if you are going to have somebody as an unindicted co-conspirator, you list them as unindicted co-conspirator number one, because if you say they are unindicted co-conspirator by name, then that person is named as a co-conspirator with no forum to clear their name to say, I'm not a co-conspirator because they've not been charged. And so there's no way that they can come forward. Similarly, in this case, he has essentially tarnished the president without giving him an opportunity in a court of law to clear his name. In some sense, in terms of clearing one's name, Biden might have been advantage to be charged, and I mean it seriously, but because he then at least would have been able to say, I am not an old man with a bad memory. I am a vital 81-year-old who is fully capable of responding to accusations against me and, of course, running the country. So I thought it was bad. Now, her tried to follow what I'll call Robert Mueller's style when he testified in 2019 about the Trump-Russia findings, sticking to his report. You know, people would question him. He'd go, yes, that's what that page said. Not that's what I wrote, but that's what that page said. Was that successful for him? Well, it was successful in the sense that he didn't get himself involved in lengthy what-if types of conversations. But I think he could have been more elaborate in his answer. I think he could have said, look, I wrote this this way because we were thinking along these lines. So I think an explanation of the black letters on his report would have advantaged him and would have allowed the listening public and the members of Congress to understand better what his thinking was. I think it was smart of him to not get trapped into hypotheticals. What if this was a 60-year-old man instead of an 81-year-old man? What if it was Tuesday instead of Wednesday? I don't think that would have behooved him in any way, but I think he could have been a little bit more forthcoming in letting us understand the thought process that went into his written report. So obviously there were different aims of the questioning, with the Republicans trying to show that there was enough evidence to prosecute Biden and he got a pass. The Democrats trying to show that Biden was exonerated and his memory was good. I mean, start with the Republicans. Did they make a pretty good case that there was enough evidence here to charge Biden? Well, this was the problem that I had that we've just been talking about. Her apparently believed that there wasn't enough evidence to overcome a defense that Biden might put on. And so the evidence of willfulness had to have been much weaker than the Republicans thought it was. 
Because if you had very strong evidence of retention and willfulness in terms of sharing, then the idea that a prospective defendant might present himself to the jury as sympathetic would be of no moment. There's no prosecutor that I know of who says, well, this is a likable old man, but I've got overwhelming evidence, and therefore I'm not going to charge. I think the evidence was weaker than the Republicans wanted it to be. But because Hur didn't explain the weaknesses in his evidence of willfulness, it allowed, yes, the great sound bites for them to say, let me see if I understand just the elements of the crime. He possessed, he knew he possessed, he shared, he knew when he shared it was classified. What am I missing here, was the question the Republicans asked. And Hur said, because he was a likable old man, and that's when congressmen like Gates and others said, I'm sorry, are you creating a forgetful old man defense? It was Van Drew who said, are we creating a new precedent of that if you're likable, forgetful old man, hell with the evidence, we're not going to charge you? And her was susceptible to that argument, and I think the Republicans were uh, you know, sort of clever to present it. I think also Jim Jordan, who I thought did a very nice job, all in all, in running this hearing, made a good point politically when he talked about Biden's motive, the $8 million reason, the $8 million he got paid for the book, and the need for Biden to show his legacy, his historical significance by saying he opposed the Afghanistan surge. So Jordan says, look, you've got willful retention, you've got willful sharing, and you've got motive. $8 million for a book, legacy desires, what more are you needing her? And I think that, you know, it's a compelling case unless her says, look, the evidence wasn't that good. It wasn't strong enough. When Biden said to the biographer, this is a classified document, and then later goes to say, well, it's not really classified, it's more sort of private, her should have said that undermines the notion of willful distribution because he's trying to explain how he defines classified, but her didn't engage that way, and therefore I think the Republicans made good points. Coming up, the Democrats take on her, and a Georgia judge dismisses three charges against Trump. I'm June Grosso, and you're listening to Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. Through four hours of aggressive questioning from both Democratic and Republican members of the House Judiciary Committee, Special Counsel Robert Hur tried to defend the conclusions of his year-long investigation and his 345-page report that recommended no criminal charges be brought against President Joe Biden for his handling of classified documents. He tried to confine his precisely worded answers to the exact words of the report, despite questions and hypotheticals trying to get him to say either that Biden was guilty or that he had been exonerated. Ironically, it was the questioning from Democratic Representative Pramila Jayapal that brought out her most damaging statement about Biden. Congresswoman, that is one statute that we analyzed. I need to um, go back and, and make sure that I take take note of the word that you use, uh, exoneration. That Mr. is not a word Her, that I'm going to continue with my questions. I'm going to continue with my questions. I know that, that I the term that I ultimately reached. I know that whether the term sufficient evidence existed such that the likely you outcome you, you exonerated would be a conviction. I know that, that the term willful retention has a Mr. Hurd, it's my time. I've been talking to former federal prosecutor Michael Zeldin. So, Michael, you talked about how the Republicans did with their questioning of her. How did the Democrats do? Some of them, like Zoe Lofgren, I think was terrific when she said, let me understand something about this Afghanistan memo. Was that not a handwritten memo that Biden wrote? Yes, it was. Let's now talk about Reagan and his diaries. Were they not handwritten memoranda? Yeah, they were diary entries. Did the Justice Department not say that those types of diary entries are not covered. Yes, they did. So, ergo, the Biden memo was a diary. Could it not be said? So I think that was a very good exchange. I think Schiff did a good job in trying to ferret out the tin ear that, that her had. But most of the others were just making political speeches. And I thought that that was unfortunate. You know, they did make some points with respect to Trump and the obstruction part of the indictment being nothing like the Biden 
part of the indictment. And so I think it was important for them to articulate that there really is a difference, even if there is some similarity on willful retention and distribution. There's a whole world of difference with respect to obstruction. Her played no part in the investigation into Trump's handling of classified documents. Did he make a mistake by discussing the material distinctions between the Biden and Trump cases in his report? Should he have just left Trump out? I think he had no choice but to say, I know this other indictment exists, and the facts of that case are materially different from the facts of this case. Because think of what this hearing would have been like if he didn't recognize the distinction. Then you'd have Republicans screaming apples to apples, why did one get indicted, one not get indicted, with no opportunity for her to respond to the differences between them. If he's going to stick to his report, I think that had to be in his report, because otherwise I think he's put in a terrible position of not being able to answer the question of why one got it and one didn't get it. So the Justice Department released the transcript of Hur's interview with Biden before the hearing, which I'd say was not coincidental timing. And the Democrats used that. Was Hur's testimony undercut by the excerpts from the transcript, which seemed to show that Joe Biden was not as forgetful, his memory was not as bad as Hur made it out to be? That's right. And that the evidence of willfulness was more equivocal than the report seemed to make it. I think the Justice Department should have released this long before this hearing. I think it was a mistake for the Justice Department to release this report so close to the hearing. I think it would have been better if the committee had this transcript earlier so that it could be fully evaluated and that it could be factored more intelligently or more meaningfully in in the questioning. So, yeah, I think it was not coincidental, but I think it was unfortunate that we didn't really get the benefit of that transcript fully in the exploration with her about the nature of his evidence. There was this almost comical back and forth between her and Democrat Pramila Jayapal about whether her had exonerated Biden. It was like, you did. I didn't. You did. And they talked over each other. What's the difference to a prosecutor between exonerating someone and not charging someone? Well, not charging someone is possibly I'm not going to charge them, even though I think they did something criminal, because I don't think I can prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt because key pieces of evidence are missing or a key witness is, is not cooperating And therefore, while I believe the person is guilty of this, I can't prove my case beyond a reasonable doubt, and therefore I'm not going to bring it. That's very different than saying the person is innocent, did nothing wrong. So it might seem like a fine line, but not being able to prove a case and saying a person is innocent are two different things. And I thought when the congresswoman engaged in the conversation with him about was this exoneration or was this not exoneration, She didn't help the Democrat cause because the headlines I saw after the hearing was her refuses to exonerate Biden. How is that a helpful exchange? So I think that like in the Mueller report where Mueller wrote, if we had confidence that the president did not commit a crime, we would have said so. That for me was a terrible line. That was very problematic because essentially it says he may be a criminal, but we can't yet prove it. I just don't think you do things like that. I don't think that's what declination or non memos should be all about. Do you think the differences between the Biden case and the Trump case were made clear during that four hours, or was it muddled? Well, it was definitely made clear with respect to obstruction. It's quite clear that her was unequivocal that Biden cooperated and that there was nothing that was obstructive by Biden. There may have been a little bit of obstructive behavior by the ghostwriter in deleting an audio conversation. But with respect to Biden, Biden cooperated. Trump did not. And I thought that was really brought home over and over by everybody on the Democrat and even in hers case, that these are two materially different cases. 
So, Michael, what do you think the average person should get out of this testimony? Well, the average person should say this five minutes per person <laughs> round of questioning process is horrible. It doesn't lend itself to coherence. And couldn't they just have one or two people conduct these conversations with these witnesses in a way that we could get to the bottom of things? And two, congressmen, even if they were former federal prosecutors or former state prosecutors, don't seem to know how to ask a question. This was so scripted. Nobody listened to the, to the testimony. They asked their pre-written questions, even though the exact question was asked just before them, and the exact answer was elicited that they elicited. I mean, it was a horrible, horrible process. But in the bottom line, I think people are going to not have their opinion changed by this. I think that the notion that Biden is an old man is is baked in among uh, Republicans and some Democrats and independents. I think that the notion that Trump is being treated differently and worse is baked in within the MAGA crowd, and that special prosecutors have a lot of work to do in bringing clarity to their analysis. When you look at the Mueller report, you look at the Durham report, you look at the her report, all these reports did was make things more confusing. They, they brought no clarity whatsoever to the circumstances that they were designed to investigate and report on. So I think people are going to come away from this disappointed and they'll hear what you want to hear and disregard the West, as Paul Simon saying in the box. I love that song. So does this show that Attorney General Merrick Garland is using special counsels too much? He's using special counsels in so many instances. Yeah, I don't know what Merrick Garland should do. It's such a acrimonious time with this notion of the weaponized Justice Department that on the heels of the Barr debacle with the Mueller report where Mueller submits the report to Barr, or sits on it for a while, then gives his own summary of it, which Mueller objects to, and it turns out to be decidedly misleading. All Merrick Garland can really say is, I don't want to put the Justice Department in that position, and the best way for me to insulate the Justice Department from criticism is to use special counsel. But I don't think it's working very well. Mm. Well, one of the Trump cases that has nothing to do with the Justice Department is the Georgia 2020 election interference case. Today, Judge Scott McAfee, the trial judge, threw out three of the charges against former President Donald Trump that have to do with soliciting public officers to violate their oaths. Why did the judge dismiss those counts? So what I can gather from the eight-page order is that he said that while this conduct is probably criminal. It wasn't pled, meaning the indictment itself, with enough specificity so that the defendants could understand specifically what conduct they're accused of having engaged in that would give rise to a unanimous jury verdict. In pleading your case as a prosecutor in your indictment, you have to set forth clearly what is the evidence and what is the statute that evidence violates. And the judge felt here that the way the case was written, the way the case was pled, there was a possibility of confusion by the defendants about what they had to defend themselves against. And so he said, look, unless you cure this, which I think they have the authority to do, they can go back to a grand jury and supersede this indictment to make these counts more clear, consistent with what the judge orders. Until then, the judge says, look, it's these defendants, they just don't know how to defend this case because of the way you wrote it. So in, unless and until you do that, I'm not going to let you bring these charges before me, which I think is a, is a fine ruling in that I think defendants are entitled to know specifically what crime they're accused of and what conduct they engaged in that the prosecutors believe gave rise to a, the indictment. So I've got no problem with decision and whether or not the prosecutors tweak their language to satisfy him is up to them. But I'm all for clarity in charging documents so that people's constitutional right to defend themselves can be fully achieved. What's ironic about this is that one of the charges relates to something that's been clear for how many years, which is Donald Trump's call to the Georgia Secretary of State asking him to find 11,000 some odd votes. Well, so 
there's a call between Trump and uh, Secretary of State Rastenberger where he says, all I need is 11,780 votes, one more than we have. But that was a charge that said you are asking the Secretary of State to violate his oath to make sure that there is election integrity. And what the court said is, explain to me a little bit more clearly how that phone call specifically violated that statute. He said something like there's an abundance of evidence here, but the way it was pled, you know, the specific way it was written was just not not clear enough. And so he's not saying that's not necessarily innocent behavior. He's just saying articulate it more clearly so that Trump and company know exactly what it is about that conversation that you think caused Rassenberger to have to violate his oath of office were he to have have followed it. So it's just seeking clarity. I mean, as a prosecutor for a long, long time, I started out as a defense attorney, and I always thought that the tables are so stacked in favor of prosecutors that when a court can sort of level the field to make sure that defense and defendants particularly have a fair shot at understanding what they're being charged with and how they can possibly defend themselves, I'm, I'm all for it. Thanks so much, Michael. That's former federal prosecutor Michael Zeldin. Coming up, a fight over a national wildlife refuge in Georgia. This is Bloomberg. The Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge is a pristine 680-square-mile wilderness in Georgia, an ecological wonder that's a haven for threatened and endangered species and is world-renowned for its amphibian populations. It's one of the world's largest intact freshwater ecosystems and was designated a wetland of international importance by the United Nations in 1971. And now the federal government is making an unprecedented water rights claim to try to prevent a mining company from pumping so much groundwater for a proposed mine that it could cut off part of the swamp's water source, imperiling its biodiversity and its original purpose as a refuge from migratory birds. Joining me is a water rights expert, Ryan Roberry, a professor at the Georgia State University Law School. Ryan, tell us about the facts. Describe what's happening here. Sure. I mean, the facts are, I mean, quite simple. There is the Okefenokee Swamp, part of which is a national wildlife refuge, uh, obviously a very large swamp in southern Georgia, about three miles away from that in the southeast section of the Okefenokee Swamp. A uh, mining company wants uh, some permits to uh, some groundwater pumping permits because there's a lot of water. Mining is a water-intensive process. They've applied for some permits to mine titanium dioxide, um, and that that process of sort of using the groundwater and pumping the groundwater uh, would affect uh, the water flow going through the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. So that is the, the challenge right now is the, the water quantity issue that may happen because of these permits. And would that lack of water be a hazard to the species there that have been protected? Absolutely. So, I mean, I'm I'm not a hydrologist, but some hydrologists have studied this, and they they say that about 16 percent, it could cause a diminution of water, about 16 percent of the recharge of the aquifer that sort of naturally feeds the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, If that happens, that has a very big negative impact on some endangered species, the ability of the swamp to, and, and it's the creatures inside the swamp, some of the trees, grasses, some of the animals, it would negatively impact them um, if, that is, if that is the case, is that there's a 16% diminution. And that is what's at issue here, is what kind of damage, if any, would the groundwater permits pose to the National Wildlife Refuge? Uh, and that's when you get into the hydrology of it. And I just want to clarify one thing. The Georgia Environmental Protection Division issued a draft permit Correct. to build Correct. to build this mine, and there was a public hearing? Correct. There was a public hearing, and uh, there were some uh, complaints lodged. They, so this has been going on for a couple of years now. This has not just come out of the blue. Um, and now they are in the midst of the draft permit is sort of saying, this is the permit we want to give the mining company. They're accepting public comment on it, I believe, up until the early part of April, uh, at which time they will make a decision on whether to uh, 
grant the permit to the mining company or not. I mean, do you know if the public's in favor of the mining company or keeping the National Refuge clean? I mean, the, the most people that I've talked to are far more concerned about the, the National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, we don't have many spots like this in the east, particularly the eastern United States. Um, I'm sure there are people on the other side that would say, you know, of course, the mine would provide jobs, economy, those kinds of things. And so there's there's always going to be a built in tension between sort of preservation or economic development. So the government and when I say the government, are we talking about the Fish and Wildlife Service when we say Yes, that? we're talking about okay. the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Yes, ma'am. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service made a claim in January asserting its federal reserved water rights at Okefenokee. Is that Correct. unusual? Absolutely. This is highly unusual. In fact, I think it's the first time that Federal Reserve water rights have been asserted east of the Mississippi River. Um, and the reason for that is in the United States, we generally speaking have two different water systems, one for the west, one for the east. In the west, where it's very arid and dry, where I grew up in Idaho and Colorado, you have prior appropriation. First in time, first in right. There's sort of a pecking order of who gets the water. The federal, the government has asserted its Federal Reserve water rights, which is a simply this. It's simply a claim that when the federal government reserves some land, that it also implicitly reserves the water necessary for that land to function as a reservation. Um, that has been asserted in the West. In the East, we have a, ripar- lar- a regulated riparian system. Riparian system is predicated on the premise that there's enough water for everybody. You just have to share it reasonably. And I think one of the challenges is is that with climate change, with increased industrial use, uh, we are seeing that there's not probably might not be enough water for everybody anymore in the riparian state. And so in this case, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has asserted its Federal Reserve water rights, which, again, in a riparian state, I believe this is the first time this has happened. So, it, yes, it is a big deal. The mining company claims, A, that the mine won't harm the reserve, and that Federal sure. Reserve water rights is a doctrine exclusive to Western water law. Where do you stand on this? I don't think it's exclusive to Western water law at all. I mean, there is some argument that says, well, it has to be land that was reserved in the public domain, of which Georgia was not part of that because it's part of the original 13 colonies. But to me, the doctrine of Federal Reserve water rights it doesn't depend on the status of the land that the government reserved. It simply depends upon the reason for which the federal government reserved the land. In the case of the Okefenokee, it reserved the land to protect the water, the wildlife, the trees, etc. And therefore, the intent would have been to preserve enough water for that congressionally federalized, the congressionally recognized intent uh, to take place. So. I am not of the opinion it's just a Western issue. Um, the, I think that the facts on the ground have changed and that there's not enough water in the East for everybody anymore. And this is a right that the federal government can assert. There's no problem, from my, my opinion. So the acting regional director of Fish and Wildlife Service, Mike mm-hmm. Oker, said that federal reserve water rights include all the water needed to maintain the purpose of the Okefenokee Refuge, which President Franklin Roosevelt created to protect migratory birds in 1937 with an executive order under the Migratory Bird Conservation Act. Shouldn't that be enough that it's a federal reserve and it has to be protected? Yeah, I mean, the challenge here, again, is the groundwater the, the permits are not on the Federal Reserve, right? They are outside of it by about three miles. And so the issue then is what kinds of things can the federal government regulate that don't actually take place on federal land but could impact federal land? Uh, and so that's, I think, the real nub of the issue here. Um, and the simple fact that Federal Reserve water rights have not been asserted in the East has led some people to believe that well, they aren't, they aren't applicable in a riparian jurisdiction, which, again, I think is wrong. It's just the fact that probably we've had enough water in the past to handle everything. And now that seems to be changing. So tell us about this unanimous 1976 Supreme Court opinion that the Fish and Wildlife Service is relying on. Sure. That's the, the case of U.S.B. Capper. Um, and that was 
a uh, an assertion of a Federal Reserve water right, I believe, for, for the Devil's Hole to protect uh, a certain a small type of fish. So that would be in the western United States again. But this also expanded the notion of Federal Reserve water rights, not just to Native American reservations or national parks, but to all federal reservations. That includes national wildlife refuges, etc. cetera. Um, and that says, simply, say, simply stated, Capper says, The primary purpose of a federal reservation and that that primary purpose needs to be served by the water, um, that is that is allotted to it. Uh, So it's really the protection of the primary purpose for which a reservation was made. And in the case of the Okefenokee Swamp, clearly water is part of a swamp um, and part of the National Wildlife Refuge. And so fulfilling that primary purpose, it's whatever that minimum amount is needed to fulfill the primary purpose. And that minimum amount, nobody knows. Nobody knows what is the minimum amount needed. And so that would require hydrologists to sort of get active and get involved. And I'm sure there will be disputes over what is the minimum amount necessary. Do most water rights experts think that federal water rights take precedence over state groundwater rights? Absolutely. Absolutely. The federal claim would take precedence. That's, That's pretty clear. If, if the Federal Reserve water right exists, it, is, it, is, it supersedes state water rights. So what, what do experts disagree on? Well, I think some experts disagree on whether Federal Reserve water rights exist in riparian states like Georgia and regulated riparian states. Um, and then the question is, is how do you make it fit? You're essentially saying we should privilege the water usage of the National Wildlife Ref- Refuge in the Okefenokee over other competing claims from, you know, mining companies or municipal industrial use, how are you going to fit that in to a system that for many times, for many years, has not really looked at who gets it first, who gets it second, but it's been based off of, are you using the water reasonably? Uh, And that's a very different question than in the West, where you have a pecking order that is clearly established on who gets the first amount and how much they get, who gets the second. We don't have those same systems set up in the East. So how it fits in to a sort of a reasonable use standard system, which is very sort of ambiguous and opaque, uh, is still to be determined. Would this end with the Georgia Environmental Protection Division saying, no, we're not going to give you a permit? It's possible. It's possible. I think what's going to happen and what should happen is that Georgia EPD and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, need to sit down and talk about the Federal Reserve water right, and more importantly, how much water is necessary for the Okefenokee to actually fulfill its mandated purpose. I think that should be the next step. Um, it, I don't think it has to be yes or no on the permit. I think it should be we're going to have to wait until we figure out these conversations with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. There is no legal case yet. No, correct. There is no. But it's been going on for years and still no legal case? <laughs> well, the, the question about whether they were going to get a permit, how much water would, would they be pumping out of the ground, et cetera. If, and then once you find out all that, that information, well, does that harm or could it harm the Okefenokee Swamp or not? All of those questions, that's what's been going on over the several years. There's been a lot of fact-finding and a lot of, of documents being put together so that Georgia EPD would be able to assess whether or not a permit was should be granted. So, so that's what's been going on. And it takes it takes years for mining permits to happen. So this is not ab- abnormal. Oh. Um, this is this is part of the process of any sort of large mining operation, whether in the western U.S. or the east. So it takes a lot of groundwork uh, to get your permits in order so that you can bring a mine online. Well, we'll have to keep track of this. Thanks so much, Ryan. That's Professor Ryan Roberry of the Georgia State University Law School. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Podcast. Remember, you can always get the latest legal news by subscribing and listening to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. I'm June Grosso, and this is Bloomberg.